Oh, hi, this is Andy Braitman again. We're back with Cheap Joe's talking about um, the encaustic process. I wanted to break down some of the materials that we use. Again, it's very similar to other kinds of painting. You need, like in watercolor, you'll need ways, a palette to hold your paint. You'll need brushes. In, um, in encaustic painting, you have the same devices, but they have to handle heat and liquid that gets hot and cold or hardens and gets wet again. So to that end, um, I use a wok, I use a hot plate. Uh, there's this wonderful uh, um, surface you can work on. It's a heated surface that'll hold your, uh, that'll hold your uh, thermostat and give you the right temperature. And, these, and the important part about these things is the, about the containers is the bottom of them. It, gives, it allows for a really good contact and lets you know exactly the temperature, as opposed to some of the ones that I've been using over the years that have um, little ridges to them so that I'm not getting a complete contact with a hot plate and I have a, I'm not as certain of the temperature. So finding a tin, and I used to get them from Dean and DeLuca, actually they have these beautiful tins and I'll find them for the next segment that have no ridges on the flat but you have to spend money at Dean and DeLuca to buy jelly beans or whatever comes in those tins and sometimes that may not be worth it but it depends on the amount of material you're using so if I'm using a lot of material I, I will want to use a bigger tin if I'm using a small amount of material I'll be fine with these smaller tins so these are going to actually hold different colors so depending on what you're doing the tins will hold I'll have a tin assigned to different color and different colored pigments. This is a, a bag of encaustic medium, and this will melt, and, I can, and um, I've just started to melt some of it in here, and you can see it, it looks very um, milky, and this comes in these little crystalline, these little beads, and when the beads melt, this holds, uh, this is the medium that holds the color. Uh, RNF has made these uh, sticks, just like a, a watercolor uh, block. Uh, you know, like uh, the little tablets of watercolor or a tube of paint. Uh, these are, um, this is pigment held in and suspended in an encaustic medium. And I'm trying to unwrap it, but like in the world of wrapping today, it's not easy. Um, and so the encaustic, this is a stick of encaustic, and I wanted to feel it because if it didn't have a varnish in it, it would be very pliable. Sennelier makes these um, sticks that Cheap Joe's also sells that are uh, much more pliable. And you can see that it's, it's, it's compared to this, it's a much softer surface. And it, it's a question of how much varnish or how much hardening there is in there. Uh, the advantage to this is that it, you can manipulate it in a cold state longer than this. This is not as manipulatable when it's cold, but it's very manipulatable when it's warm. So you keep this warmer. Um, and these are the different, different uh, materials you use. So you have the different paints and pigments, and the tins, you're not limited to uh, the RNF uh, colors. You can make your, make your own oil, your own color by mixing oil paint of any brand with this medium, and that's why I have these different tins, and that'll allow you to make uh, whatever color you want and mix them carefully so you have as much control uh, with the color choices. Uh, like any other form of oil painting, the color choice is your vocabulary. So you want to be very careful about choosing the right color and not necessarily succumbing to whatever the manufacturer has made for you. This is a beautiful color, by the way. That's that King's Blue. And I will try to pick a palette that's going to be attractive before I ever start. So, you know, if I can, and I'm missing like a light orange here, so I would probably use maybe one of some combination of these colors in a separate tin to mix the third basic color in my palette for this painting. And I would start with a pretty palette to begin with. So these are some of the materials in terms of the paint. Then the applying, in applying these materials, again, you have a variety of tools. The most standard are um, brushes. I'll use brushes of different sizes, and these will be brushes that are dedicated to encaustic painting because you can clean them but they're never really clean. You're always, you'll always have that wax in the brush, in the bristle, and you want to make certain that you, um, as you switch back and forth from material to material, you have the right tool. This is a, a, a polyester or a synthetic fiber, and I'll use this to coat the surfaces with gesso. Whichever gesso I'm using, I'll coat the surface with a polyester fiber. For the most part, 
the brushes I use to apply the encaustic are all uh, bristle brushes. These are oxtail bristle brushes, any oil brush. You want a sturdy bristle though, you don't want a soft bristle. And you'll notice that a lot of the chip brushes or wash brushes you get are very soft. Um, you want to feel the, uh, these, these should be strong enough to be wet and hold a, a weight. And uh, Jack Richardson makes a really good brush for that purpose. They're very inexpensive. Uh, and they're called uh, wash brushes, I think, but they're a uniquely good brush. These are Cheap Joe's Workhorse brushes, and they equally have that same strength in the bristle. And they're able to hold the paint and apply them well. Uh, this is also an uh, interesting tool, and this is not so much to scoop up paint and apply it as much as it is to manipulate the paint when it's on the surface. And to that end, we have, a, and this is unique to the encaustic, we have a whole set of tools that are designed to subtract paint. Normally, we're just an additive process. But once the paint is on the surface, we can manipulate it with these tools. So that's a subtractive way of gouging into the surface or lifting or cutting. And I'll use different tools for that, some metal tools, some plastic tools, each of them having their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, I happen to like something that's uh, got a harder, straighter uh, uh, edge to it because I. I tend to work large, and I, this, this is a more efficient tool for me, but all of these other tools are very f flexible and pliable and have their own strengths. The material that we have here is meant to be done on a tabletop and a smaller scale, and I normally work on a more industrial level. So uh, the materials I have here are bigger versions of what we have here. Uh, and this is a box of powdered pigments. You can see I'm very well organized. Gamblin makes uh, these. I've gotten them from Cheap Joe's, and other companies make them. They're powdered pigments, and uh, again, there's a. Anytime you work with a particulate matter, something that floats in the air, you want to be very careful about breathing this. So, if you're going to work with this, you need to have a dust mask. Um, and I just wanted you to see this is a much more handleable way of working with the material than this is. They didn't have these when I was working when I got started, so I never got used to it. Uh, so what we're going to do is start to paint, and I'm going to show you different ways of working both with the sticks, with melting your materials and working them, and with working off the hot plate. Uh, and we're going to try to get all of this stuff handled. Um, but I wanted you to see everything first, because this, is, this requires room, and it requires space, and it requires ventilation. And you can't see it, but I've got a fan over here, a fan over here, a fan overhead. There's plenty of lights. This is. Um, this requires room and space. It's not something you do at your kitchen table. It's become a very vogue way to work, but there's no real reason to work in encaustic except for the two elements. One is that it allows you to support an aggregate of some kind, so you can actually build a surface. That's, a really, that's the main reason I started working with encaustic was I liked surface and I wanted to hold an aggregate. And uh, one of the aggregates I use is something called kyanite, and I'll show you that later. Um, pumice can be used, uh, carborundum. There are all kinds of inert materials that can be held and provide surface. Uh, another reason to use the wax is there's a smoky sense of color that allows for uh, a sense of atmospheric reality on the surface of a painting. That's a really nice uh, a application for the, a reason to use the wax. And a third is the impasto effect of a brush stroke that's just so beautiful on a can on a painted surface and then the ability to score back into it with these subtractive tools so it's a wonderful medium but it's got you're not going to paint a traditional painting with it you, you're going to paint uh, because it's it's limited in that ability to manipulate and move the paint it's it, you lay the stroke down and it cools and you're done with it so uh, you can work back into it when it's cool, you can burnish, you can fuse, you can layer, but you're not, it's not a traditional way of handling paint where you're manipulating the surface, uh, where you're moving the paint. Paint stays there, you can move it on a cold fashion, we'll get into that later. But this is the kind of material and amount of room that you're gonna need.